So good morning, everyone. I'm Gigi Neal with OSU Extension here in Claremont County. And with us today, we have Amy Stone, who is coming to us from the other side of the state, clear up north in Lucas County. And she had a, a lot more snow and colder weather than we did, but she is going to bring us around to our things we need to look for this summer, keep our eye out for, um, and hopefully we don't spot any of the one, but if we do, she's gonna tell us how to uh, contact people and do the record, do the data research to help get it taken care of. Go ahead, Amy. All right, thanks, Gigi. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just um, stop my video, just kind of help sometimes with the bandwidth issue. Um, and I really appreciate you tuning in. Um, I know this is a perennial school um, and often you wanna hear about the, the greatest and the latest or how to maintain those perennials. Um, and I'm gonna talk about two insects that um, you may, may not encounter in your own uh, perennial garden and just trying to raise awareness. And so I really appreciate your uh, willingness to tune in and learn more about um, these two pests. Um, and really periodic cicada really isn't a pest, but one native and one non-native. All right, let me get over here. So um, I just snapped a few um, photos of some perennials um, that are coming back um, in my own garden. Um, and like Gigi said, we uh, were in kind of the, the mid to high 20s last night um, and was a recipient of about five inches of snow. And so um, I'm anxious to get outdoors and see kind of what some damage um, has occurred and also um, just to get back out gardening as soon as I can. We're gonna start out the, the session uh, this morning uh, with the spotted lanternfly. And many of you may have heard about this insect or been tuned in to some other uh, programming about this insect. And so hopefully some of the information I'm presenting today will be a review. Um, if not, I'm glad that you're tuning in and learning more about this non-native species. What I wanna do when we talk about spotted lanternfly is to break it down just a little bit. We're gonna start out with an introduction um, what is that insect? Uh, where is it at? Um, why should you care about it? And then what can you do? So let's get going. Yes, another invasive species is on the radar. Um, and I know that um, being from Claremont County, you're very familiar with invasive species and the impact that they can have on our environment. Um, so we're hoping to gather as many people to join in this battle of spotted lanternfly. And when I say battle, right now, it is just a battle of detection. And so we're out looking for this insect. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about where it's, it's at. So this critter is, um, has a pretty broad native range um, in Asia. In 2016, or 2006, I'm sorry, it was discovered in Korea, which was actually outside of the native range. And so there was a lot of research and studies that occurred in Korea, specifically to one of the host plants, which is grapes. In 2014, it was discovered for the very first time in North America in Eastern Pennsylvania. Um, unfortunately, it's continuing to spread naturally through its own movement and then unfortunately through some artificial movement that we'll talk about. In 2020, it was discovered in Ohio um, and there were a couple finds of just isolated infestations or isolated populations, sorry. So it was one insect that was determined to have hitchhiked on a vehicle or cargo. Um, the insect was um, not living. Um, in many of those cases, um, they did a lot of scouting and evaluation to determine that it was just a single insect and so not a reproducing population. But unfortunately, later in the year, last fall, we did find a reproducing population in the state. So when we talk about spotted lanternfly, um, its discovery or its pathway is very similar to all other invasive species. So there's the discovery of the 
the pest to begin with, and then a lot of effort into survey, and then of course research. Um, and then you implement some of those findings from the research that was discovered or research for that was was that happened to, to occur. There's a lot of outreach and awareness going on. Um, and then finally evaluating those implemented practices to see, are they working? You make adjustments, there's more discoveries and it kind of continues. And there's a lot of things going on at the same time. This map is kind of one of the first um, early maps. Um, Berks County was the initial infestation or discovery. Um, it's kind of outside of um, Philadelphia. So this is Eastern PA, and this is actually three years into the SLF infestation. So you can see that initial find there kind of in the center, and then the population is radiating out to include multiple counties. This is five years into the infestation. So the map is dated November 25th, 2019. You can see that the largest blue area is that Berks County and those first counties that were infested with spotted lanternfly. You'll also notice some gold counties and those counties were kind of how I described those first finds in Ohio were. So individual um, adults primarily of the insect that hitchhiked um, on a vehicle or some way to get to those new sites. Um, but when it was found or discovered, it was just that insect. And so it wasn't a reproducing population. So you can see there, unfortunately, was a lot of movement early on, even with outreach um, and engagement to try to reduce that situation. Just a few months later, um, so this map is dated January 2nd, 2020. You'll notice um, kind of the same blues and golds, but there are two counties in Western Pennsylvania, right near the Ohio and West Virginia line. So I've got that kind of circling that with my pointer here. And that of course, um, obviously raised um, more interest, awareness, um, I don't want to say excitement because that's really not a good description of what we were feeling, uh, but obviously it's getting closer to Ohio and maybe a greater concern that the insect is here or could be here very quickly. You'll see um, this map, um, again, some, some um, more blue counties, those that have reproducing populations you'll notice the gold counties have disappeared. And if you look really closely, um, it can be difficult on a screen depending on um, what you're using. Those gold counties were actually, um, you'll see purple dots rather than gold counties. And so again, those are those individual uh, finds, but not a reproducing population. But what else you'll notice on this map is we now have a blue county in Ohio. In County. The infestation is in Mingo Junction, um, right near the state line or the border. The other thing that I wanted to point out real quickly is the, the, um, the red lines along the blue counties are the current quarantine. So there are quarantine, um, quarantines in place to hopefully reduce the, the further spread of this insect, especially artificially. Uh, this map is about a, a month old, and you can see now from that initial find in Eastern Pennsylvania, all the way over to the Ohio line, there is kind of a contiguous line or area. Um, and part of that that we'll discuss is the movement of this insect and how it's getting from place to place. So with that introduction, you know, what is spotted lanternfly? Um, thanks to Joe Boggs and his creative PowerPoint skills, um, he has grown this um, spotted lanternfly to be a little bit larger than life. And so although it is rather large, um, it's not quite this large. Um, the insect, both in the adult stage and the nymph stage, so has it, it has an incomplete life cycle, um, is a plant hopper. 
And so sometimes there's confusion about that because it's called spotted lantern fly. It's not a true fly at all. Um, some people say that the adult looks moth-like. Um, and so that can lead to some confusion. Uh, but this insect actually is in the plant hopper group. And they're both, um, as a nymph and adult, are using mouth parts to pierce in and suck the phloem out of the plant. So that's what they're getting that sugary substance that they want to live off of. There is one generation per year. And right now, um, this insect is still in the egg mass stage. Um, and shortly, as temperatures warm up, will begin to emerge as that first instar nymph. We're gonna go through each stage of the life cycle and what to look for when. Um, so when you're out in your garden, uh, paying attention to the plants and, and taking care of those plants, um, you can always have just a, a little in the back of your mind, um, gosh, if I see an insect, I just wanna make sure that it's not spotted lanternfly. So let's start out with the adults um, because I think it's um, fairly common for people to see the adults um, and report the adults. Um, the nymphs are rather small and so sometimes difficult to see or notice. Uh, but you'll see here, these adults are, are pretty good size and um, they're about an inch long and a an half inch wide um, and just very showy. And so they would actually kind of draw attention to themselves. They do have this great um, coloration that is kind of advertising defense chemicals or a mechanism. And so if you know a bird is happening to go by, other wildlife or even other insect predators or parasitoids, um, you know, they can flash those wings um, and kind of like maybe threaten or scare away something that's coming after them. They do have this flashy display. And so it's almost kind of like a silvery, there is some yellow in the um, abdomen of the insect. Again, very showy, very bright, um, kind of eye-catching. They are considered poor flyers and they almost kind of flutter around. And so it's not like they're gonna take off and go for miles. Um, and, and I think this photo really illustrates where some people you know, could get it confused with a moth. So it has that moth-like appearance, but again, it's a plant hopper. And if you look at the insect head on, um, they hold their wings almost in a tent shape or tent like, um, you know, the, the letter V pattern. And so that's something to kind of look at, whereas some of the photos that I'm showing almost appear a little bit flatter. This photo was actually taken by Erica in Jefferson County. Erica is our Ag and Natural Resources educator. And this was a female that was captured in her county. Um, and thankfully, prior to her laying eggs, so you can see that abdomen is a little bit swollen. And so um, they were able to at least reduce uh, the infection by one egg mass um, because they were able to capture her before she laid those eggs. Uh, the females tend to be a little bit larger than the males if you have a population and can compare the two side by side. Adults are going to appear in late summer. So don't go out looking for them right now. Um, in fact, this is going to be more kind of an August, September time frame. Um, and again, we can look for other things sooner, uh, but these are a little bit larger and I think are going to be easier to capture our attention. With that said, um, they can kind of camouflage into their background. And so this is an example of them gathering on the trunk of a tree. And there are, I believe, eight, or excuse me, 13 adults on that trunk. And so kind of the sum in the center kind of stand out a little bit, but we've got some down here. And so I told you how obvious and beautiful they were and eye-catching. Um, but I also kind of want to warn they will kind of look, in, look at their surroundings or look like their surroundings. You can see here we've got two insects that are mating and creating that next population or that next generation. Um, and after, she's, after they're done mating, she will lay eggs. And she lays them in a group, usually 30 to 50 eggs. And often those eggs are laid in rows, or some people have described them as in like a chain, like a hanging chain. 
after the eggs are laid, she was actually going to try to protect that egg mass a little bit, and she covers it with this waxy kind of substance. Um, when it's fresh, it is, you know, looks new, um, looks bright. You can actually, you know, they really kind of pop out. Um, but that egg mass, that coating is actually going to age. And so I'll show you some photos of what that looks like over time and how different it can appear. The egg masses are about an inch, an inch and a half uh, long and about a half to three fourths of an inch wide. And so if you can kind of think about that as a perspective or size and, and where you're going to be looking for these. Um, here's another one. You can see I, I like this one because you actually see she didn't cover the entire grouping of eggs. And so there's some at the very top that are exposed just a bit. And in fact, in this photo, you can see she's covered one egg mass um, on the bottom left. Um, and whether, I mean, this could be a, a totally separate female that laid another grouping of eggs, but for some reason, those didn't get covered. Um, and so they went through the whole winter exposed to the elements, uh, which many people believe we see a reduction in the um, survival of the nymphs when they're not covered. So egg masses can be laid on any flat surface. Um, and of course, I'm showing you um, some on tree trunks and tree branches, but now you can see this one um, or multiple egg masses on that rusty uh, barrel. Um, so any flat surface um, they can be laid at um, and you just kind of keep your eyes out and, and alert. Um, they have found that they do have an affinity to rusty metal. And so that may be something to consider as you're doing a little bit of scouting. This photo shows the exact same egg mass over a period of time. And so you can see kind of that transformation as um, that egg mass had gone through the winter, uh, was aged with the weather conditions and kind of becomes cracked and dried. And some people have described it as almost looking mud-like in appearance. Um, and so it can kind of be a little bit tricky to get your eyes trained to look for something that appears to be mud and could be, you know, on vehicles. Um, on burning barrels or, or barrels. Um, and so it can kind of disguise itself as other things. From that egg mass though, this spring, um, and it won't be too long, um, the eggs are gonna hatch into these nymphs. The nymphs will go through four stages or instars. The first three um, look pretty similar. So they're black with these white spots. They start out about a fourth of an inch um, in length. And then as they get to the fourth instar, they could be up to about three fourths of an inch. But you'll notice in that fourth instar, that's the photo on the bottom right hand side. And so that insect then develops kind of a, a reddish addition to its color pattern. And so that's one way you can easily determine, yep, that's a fourth instar. And at that stage, um, it will then become the adult, which will it will spend the rest of its life um, as an adult. Both the adults and the nymphs use these piercing sucking mouth parts to pierce in to the stems um, and then exude that sugary um, substance that they're feeding upon on our plants. They are stem feeders um, and that could include twigs and branches and the main trunk. Um, they're not going to feed on, you know, flowers or fruits or anything like that. Um, and you're probably still wondering, okay, how does this tie into perennials? And we're going to get there real shortly. You can see um, the examples that I'm showing here are actually woody ornamental um, tree type plants. Um, and so this injury likely was caused by the adults. Um, and when they remove their mouth parts, often there's an, an area where the injury occurred, that sap will continue to run down. Additionally, as they're feeding, it's being processed through their body. And of course, something is coming out the other end. That something is something we call honeydew. And so you can see kind of a, a, a collection of this sap 
and sometimes sap in combination with honeydew. And then once we have the sap and honeydew, we sometimes will see this black sooty mold come in. Now it's not to say that when you see black sooty mold, um, you should jump to the conclusion that it's spotted lanternfly because any insect um, that is, is um, feeding on the plant and exuding that honeydew, you can see black sooty mold. So we often see it with some of our scale insects. Uh, we can also see it with aphids. Um, but obviously, if you're seeing black sooty mold, you want to make sure that kind of raises the awareness and you want to get in there and try to determine what's going on. Additionally, you may see um, some um, um, yellow jackets and hornets. Um, they're drawn in typically later in the season um, to that honeydew and to that sap. And so um, interesting enough, the first um, infestation that was discovered in Pennsylvania wasn't somebody that was calling in about the spotted lanternfly specifically, but they were wondering why they are, were seeing all of these wasps and hornets around their trees. And it wasn't until an expert came out to determine that, yep, they're there, but what they're feeding off of um, is a result of this invasive species called spotted lanternfly. This kind of just really kind of pushes it home, I guess, that when you'll see what. And so you'll notice the egg mass stage goes from the end of September all the way through the following May. And so the uh, majority of its life is spent in the egg stage. The nymph is the end of April all the way through the beginning to mid-October. And so we've got overlapping, um, you know, not all eggs are gonna hatch at once, not all first instar, nymph instars are gonna emerge. So there is that overlapping and that's why you see um, some of those stages in the beginning and end um, occur at the same time. Then you'll notice the adult activity, which um, end of July, but it peaks then again, like later August, September. And they can be in that adult stage until we have a really hard freeze. Um, and at that point, those that cold temperatures will kill the insect, um, but the eggs were laid and so the, the life cycle would continue. The egg mass stage, like a lot of insects, would be a stage that um, is a concern of human assisted spread. And so if you're moving any kind of material, logs, firewood, um, outdoor furniture, um, and the insect is in that stage on those articles, wherever that material, those articles are, um, the following spring, you could have a new infestation of spotted lanternfly. And hopefully that's the, the quarantine placement is, is um, adopted to reduce that artificial spread of the insect. The adults, um, like I had mentioned earlier, are weak flyers. They're more kind of gliders. Uh, they are responsible for local spread and the movement of the insect within a county or a community. Uh, but it's the hitchhikers, especially um, with us being in Ohio, and we don't have kind of that natural spread building, uh, except in Jefferson County, which hopefully will be, um, I don't wanna say eradicated, but managed to reduce population so the spread isn't gonna be as great as it would be in other states like Pennsylvania. So let's talk a little bit about host plants. Again, still not talking about perennials yet, um, but the favorite plant of spotted lanternfly is tree of heaven or Alanthus altissima, which is a, another invasive species. Another plant though that it favors are, is grapes. And so it could be wild grape vines or those that are produced in a vineyard type setting. With that said, there are, I think the list is topping out over 70 right now. This is um, some observational data from Virginia when they had their first find of spotted lantern fly. And you can see this is where they found eggs. And if you look down that list, it's plant, 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 plant. Oh wait, concrete, a metal drum, 
Again, they're going to lay their eggs on anything that's flat, um, a flat surface. Now, this list um, are some plants that um, they didn't find egg masses on or around, but they found feeding injury. And so, you know, we talked about the wild grapes and the table grapes. Um, again, a variety of plants, um, English ivy, so maybe a, a perennial that you have in your own landscape. Um, but I will say, and this is kind of a little pixelated, um, but if you have roses, um, the nymphs um, have been known to feed on our roses, but notice even later nymphs um, are, are, I mean, they're just not going to find that plant as edible or um, I guess as delicious. And we never have observed or anybody hasn't observed um, the spotted lantern fly adults on roses. Now this list is very small. Um, like I said, it's over 70 plants. Um, and can include um, some perennials, annuals, and even some of our vegetable plants in the garden. And typically it's the nymphs that we see that have that more broad host range. Now you will notice um, Tree of Heaven, I said that that was its favorite, the nymphs and adults, I mean that, that bar that goes all the way across includes nymphs and adults. Uh, if we go down a little bit further, though, we also notice um, or have observed that they like maples, uh, primarily silver and red, but just as adults. Uh, we haven't noticed the nymphs on those plants. So we've talked about what it is. Um, now let's talk about where it's at. And some of this is a little bit of a review from the maps that I showed in my introduction. But you'll see here, this is the latest map. Um, where we had that, again, the initial find in Berks County in 2014. It was thought to have arrived by a stone shipment from China two years prior. So the population was able to build a little bit uh, before we actually discovered the insect in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, it has expanded outward, including Pennsylvania and the surrounding states. So multiple states are dealing with this insect and of course here in Ohio in Jefferson County specifically. Um, I like just to show this to kind of get a handle on what's happening in Pennsylvania since they've had to deal with spotted lanternfly the longest. So the purple counties are kind of the heart of the infestation. Um, it's been there the longest. The blue counties are the new counties that were added this year. And then the darker blue within that light blue are, is where the actual infestation is within the county. And so if you look up here um, at this, the county that kind of sits out by itself, the infestation is rather small, but unfortunately it will likely radiate out and then this area will grow, grow in size, just like we saw in Berks County originally. So in Ohio, um, the Ohio Department of Agriculture, uh, they're the ones that um, really focus on um, non-native species and the regulatory aspect of these um, pests are focusing in, this says 2020, but it again, it's gonna be 2021 as well, this proposed action area, which Lucas County is not part of, Claremont County is not part of, and it's not to say that we still, we still need your help in those areas, but ODA is focusing their efforts in those orange counties simply because of the close proximity to Pennsylvania and where this insect will likely um, come into the state first. This just shows some of their activity last year. And so the green dots are where they did survey work, whether it was a visual survey or trapping work that they would come back and revisit that same site. And thankfully, the only red dot that we see is down here in Mingo Junction, which is that initial find of spotted lanternfly. So why should you care about it? Um, you know, why, Amy, did you spend a half hour talking about this insect? What, why, did, why should it matter to me? From one to 1,000, they can become a nuisance in numbers. And so just imagine trying to be outdoors in your own garden, um, and maybe having family over um, and you see hundreds, if not thousands of these spotted lantern flies. And so obviously that um, can be a deterrent. 
Um, they're not outright killers like the Asian longhorn beetle, which is another invasive that um, you guys are, are dealing with and I'm sure well aware of in Claremont County. So, I mean, the good news is that it doesn't outright kill trees, um, but again, it can cause um, problems in nuisance levels, but then also um, there have been some orchards in Pennsylvania that the plants have been very stressed to reduce the amount of grapes that are being produced, or in some cases, when partnered with um, an extreme weather event, uh, we've had uh, vines actually die. You'll notice in that bottom photo, the adults, again, are, are along the twigs and the vines. They're not feeding on the grapes, they're not feeding on the leaves, and so it can become a problem. Just imagine trying to harvest those grapes with those insects you know, flying all over. Um, there are treatments that are available to um, vineyard owners, and you can see here where they were quite successful in all the, um, the dead insects. And so I guess the, the good point um, is that it is an insect that um, can easily, I don't want to say easily, but um, you can control and manage populations. We do know that it likes other fruit crops as well including apples. It doesn't spend a lot of time on the apples, but imagine going out to an orchard for a you pick and you just seen hundreds and thousands. I mean, that obviously may deter some visitors um, and can be difficult as you're collecting those apples to have those insects fluttering and flying around. Additionally, we see that they have or can impact or feed on hops. I had mentioned the maples. Um, there's a lot of research going on and what really is the impact to our forest? Um, you know, they might not be as much of a nuisance in a forest where there aren't a lot of people compared to our backyards. Um, the maple growers or the maple syrup producers are obviously concerned because maples are on their list. Um, good news is that they tend to like reds and silvers over sugar. Although some people are tapping, you know, silvers and we're seeing combinations and genetic hybridization uh, between the plants, but that's one to kind of keep a lookout. Um, and if you are um, tapping to look for signs and symptoms of spotted lanternfly as you're out uh, managing that sugar bush. They also see population increases in park systems, which um, again, just in their numbers, people may be discouraged from going out to enjoy nature. Um, and even in garden situations, and primarily this is the nymph stage. And so this really is, hey, just kind of picture that in your mind about what the nymphs and the adults look like. And as you're out in your garden, if you see anything that you suspect looks like that, make sure that somebody knows. Uh, they are great hitchhikers. And so I love this photo. I mean, uh, on the bottom right-hand side um, of the, the nymphs collecting on that tire. Now, as soon as that trailer moves forward or that vehicle moves forward, uh, many of them are gonna be um, you know, just crushed to their, um, their death. Um, but you can see where populations really can increase um, and, and become quite problematic. So any type of vehicular highway system is a potential threat for the movement. Also, um, cargo um, using trains. And so if you're near a train track, um, especially those coming from out east, you know, where did it originate from? Is there the potential that spotted lanternfly egg masses could have been laid on the, the rail cars? Or could the nymphs or the adults be hanging on and as it travels through, you know, fall off or jump off and then become a new infestation? So knowing your proximity to rest stops, um, gas stations, rail, um, uh, rails, and then highway systems also is important. Uh, we have had situations where dead adults were in nursery stock. And so the nursery stock originated from an infestation in Pennsylvania. They treated those plants. Um, the good news is they got really good control, 
but it was kind of a panic situation at first as they were unloading the, the trees from Pennsylvania that they saw the adults. Thankfully, they were dead. Another mode of transportation is um, they will, they don't feed on evergreens, but they will lay eggs. And so the cut Christmas tree growers are concerned and really trying to watch populations. So we don't have egg masses on trees that are being shipped out of an infested area. And then we as homeowners bring those trees in, the temperature warms up, and then we either have egg hatch inside the house um, if the tree is left in, you know, a longer period of time, or if put outside, the natural weather warms up and then the adults or the nymphs can hatch from that egg mass. So what can you do? You know what? Take a look, um, get familiar with this insect and just enjoy gardening, uh, but always have this in the back of your mind. I had mentioned kind of you know, take a look, where are railways? Where are highways? Um, and where do I live? And how would it probably get into my community? Um, likely, obviously, this far ahead of the front, um, you know, it's gonna be this artificial movement. There was an example in Lorain County, there was somebody that was buying lumber outside of Pennsylvania and the, an insect actually got in the cab with the driver and didn't realize it until he you know, ended his destination where he was dropping off that cargo. Um, and thankfully they were able to you know, get rid of that adult. Um, but it's just a good thing. If you're visiting family and friends um, in infested areas, make sure that you're not bringing anything back with you to Ohio. Pennsylvania and the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, along with the other states, are really doing a, a great job. Um, they've created these checklists for residents if they're leaving an infested area, what to look for, um, and kind of go through to hopefully reduce that artificial spread. Um, there are a couple links that I really, I think these are some good things that came out of uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension. One is possible lookalikes for the adults, because now that I've got you hopefully engaged, um, you know, if you're out looking, you may see an insect and think, oh my gosh, is that what's, what Amy was talking about? And when you don't have anything to compare it to, you likely could get confused with some of these other ones. Um, and so this is a great resource. Um, they also did something similar to egg masses and kind of what that um, confusion may be. And so those are two really good uh, resources to have. Um, most people have a, a camera on their phone, you know, just take a photo. What are you seeing? Um, and get that to somebody for confirmation. In Ohio, we are using the Great Lakes Early Detection app. Um, and so this was actually developed um, after Asian longhorn beetle was discovered in Claremont County, but we thought, gosh, we don't want people just looking for Asian longhorn beetle. We want them looking for all invasives. And so you can report um, using the Great Lakes Early Detection app. Um, additionally, you can, um, or there are monitoring traps. Um, it's the photo on the bottom right-hand side and potentially you'll start to see those pop up in the area. Um, they're a little questionable right now. There's no lure that will draw them in. Um, you just happen to have that trap on a tree that's um, infested to be able to, to get the adults or the nymphs. Uh, but we're hoping to get familiar with the traps and then the research down the line may provide us with that lure that would make them uh, more effective. And then of course, outreach and education. So telling friends and families and neighbors that, hey, I learned about this insect today. Um, you should you know, learn more about it. It should be on your radar screen. Uh, we do have um, ID cards that's shown in the top right-hand corner. And so you could become a card carrying member and pass her out or of spotted lanternfly cards. And Gigi, if you don't have a, a stash in the office, I'll make sure that you get some to, to pass those out. Additionally, beyond using the Great Lakes Early Detection app, so if an app's not for you or you're just, uh, I want to help, but I just don't want to jump in that deep, um, obviously letting Gigi know if you see something that you suspect is spotted lanternfly. 
ultimately they're going to go to the Department of Agriculture. So all of our Gledden, uh, which is the Great Lakes Early Detection Network reports, um, are forwarded to ODA. ODA also has an online reporting tool, um, telephone, and then email. They want the exact location, a photo or a sample, and your contact information. Once you start learning about spotted lanternfly, one of the things that the media is really talking about, um, and it is um, a result of what Pennsylvania and Penn State are talking about, is scraping the egg masses. Um, and, and that's wonderful. It's a way to reduce the population. But in Ohio, we want to make sure that we're reporting it first because it's not widespread. It's not in every county. Um, so yes, you can scrape egg masses, but make sure that you make that report first. I just want to briefly touch upon some management options, and then we're going to get into the cicadas. Um, but no, there's a lot of research and a lot of things going on including biological and chemical controls. Um, the good news is that there are insecticides that can manage this insect. At this point in Ohio, the only area that will be treated for spotted lanternfly is in Mingo Junction in Jefferson County. So if somebody you know, gets a hold of this and you know, knocks on your door and says, hey, I wanna um, treat for spotted lanternfly, um, just like if they would say that they want to do that for Asian longhorn beetle, your answer is no way. Um, you know, it's it's that those treatments are not recommended. Um, and we can see here we're getting excellent, um, some variable control with one of the treatments and then the excellent. So, um, you know, the good news is this one is easy, easier to manage. So hopefully you'll join that battle and I'm not sure if we're going to beat the bug, but at least we can reduce the levels to uh, populations that we can be outdoors um, and it's not going to be a tree killing pest. So with that, uh, we're going to jump into cicadas because my goodness, the cicadas have been on the news. Um, this actually is a PowerPoint, some of the slides uh, that Dr. Shetler um, or bug doc um, created for extension educators to use. Cicadas are re uh, relatively large insects. Um, they are closely related to other true bugs and bug-like insects. And from the side, you can almost kind of see that they look like a plant hopper, similar to spotted lanternfly. Um, the nymphs live under the soil in the ground, feeding on the root systems of plants. And they do that for a period of time. Um, some people call them locusts, but really they're the true locusts are grasshoppers. So it's just kind of a confusing term to use. And so we should use um, just cicadas to describe this particular insect. We have the annual or dog day cicadas. Um, an annual is kind of a misinformation because it actually takes two to eight years for those annual um, or dog day cicadas to complete their life cycle, but they have overlapping generations. So annually, we do hear them out in the landscape, but that's not going to be something that we normally hear until later in the summer into the fall. The cicadas that I'm talking about today, the periodical cicadas, are ones that we're going to be seeing rather shortly. So they're a spring into early summer insect, or that's when their activity is going to be. Some of these periodical cicadas can take 13 or 17 years um, to complete their development. And there's different broods, and they're the broods overlap. Um, and so if you look at this map, this kind of highlights some of the broods that we see in Ohio. And I just want to know you to know that that's available, that's there. But there's also a map that's really talking specifically um, about these different broods across North America. And so you can see here the different colorations. And so, um, the, the broods, I mean, it can overlap in their timing. And so you may have, you know, brood 10, and then your next experience is going to be brood, uh, you know, 11 or whatever. But what's important is there are um, different species that can make up a single brood or a single emergence 
during a period of time. And so our dog day cicadas, the ones that we hear um, every season, can take one and a half to 7.7 .7 years to complete their life cycle underground. And then we only see them visibly above ground for a short period of time. The periodical cicadas can feed underground for 12 and a half to 16 and a half years. And then the other half of their life cycle, um, it, or the other small portion of their life cycle is as adults. And that's what we're all kind of gearing up or hearing about. So um, in May, what's gonna happen, um, and we're already seeing some activity. Um, I think the colder temperatures have set them back just a bit. But um, very shortly, um, if you're in an area where the brood is emerging, um, you're gonna start to see these nymphs emerge from their burrows. Um, and they almost look like little soil chimneys that are coming out of the soil. Um, they're often found around tree trunks because that's where they're feeding, right? On the roots of those trees. Um, and so that adult emerges, finds itself a place to, to hang on to, and then will molt into the adult. And that's where we see those little, um, the skins uh, that we often play with, with even the dog day cicadas and, you know, put them on people's shoulders. Um, and it's that nymph that then um, emerged or has developed into the adult. And you can see that happening in some of Dr. Shetler's photos here. Early on, that adult is going to be a very light color. Um, and finally, it will regain or gain that, that final color that we're seeing and that we're familiar with and that they're showing us on the television. Those shells or those cast skins, um, they're going to be everywhere if you're within that brood emergence. Um, there are some nymphs that they just don't emerge properly or they can't get up onto that surface. And so other wildlife, other insects feed upon it. And so, um, I mean, not all of them survive, but because there's such a mass of them, um, it's difficult to even, you know, fathom if all of them, you know, completed their life cycle. Um, the nymphs can be tasty morsels to birds and skunks, raccoons, cats and dogs. There's been some situations where curious dogs have kind of, you um, overindulged into cicadas and it has gotten them a little bit sick. So make sure that you're watching your pets to make sure that they don't do that overindulgence. Um, once the adults are out, um, you know, their feeding is very minimal. They're gonna mate and lay eggs. And it's where they're laying the eggs is kind of where the damage occurs, if we, we call it that. And this is what it looks like. So they're laying eggs um, or groups of eggs along woody stems. Um, and there can be hundreds of species of trees and shrubs that they will choose to, to do this. Um, you can see in the bottom right hand photo um, where those egg laying sites are, the trees actually almost started to callus that, that injury over. In each of those slits, where she kind of um, you know, slices in, there can be multiple eggs, um, typically 15 to 20 eggs in each of those individual sites. And then that's gonna go up and down those stems. What happens is um, you can see here some eggs. So they peeled back the bark to actually really illustrate and show you um, where those eggs are present. But that does weaken the twig. And so the vascular tissue is, is disrupted. And so what we notice are these flags. So where the branch tips actually die or they become desiccated. Um, if it's really windy, you may have those break off and those drop. Um, it really isn't a huge deal for an established tree. Yes, it may look bad, um, but the adverse effects are relatively low. Um, what is concerning to some are newly planted trees, especially those maybe in an orchard or a nursery situation um, where some people will try to cover them. Um, the problem is they're going to be out, um, you know, for a month plus. And so if we're totally covering those plants, um, depending on what you're using, that um, can also impact the overall health of the plant. And so you can see here. Um, 
they're using like a, a small bird netting uh, where sunlight can still penetrate through, uh, but they're not covering them up like a lollipop. Um, additionally, um, I mean, insecticides are labeled um, and they're really though not super effective because they have such a long time that they're out in the environment. So you would be constantly treating um, and then potentially having um, other impacts of the insects in the environment. So you can see here, this is just comparing a female to a male. Um, you know, I think we're all familiar with the cicadas, so it's not something that we really need to train ourselves on what to look for. Uh, but you can see them here, um, again, comparing that, that male to the female. Um, and the, the female, you know, finding an appropriate egg laying site um, to lay that next generation. The good news is there's a lot of information right now that's out there um, on cicadas. In fact, um, there's stories, gosh, on a weekly basis in Toledo, and we're not even part of that brood 10 emergence. Um, and so I think they're getting people all excited and anxious, um, but really not for anything, at least up in our area. But with that said, uh, people are tracking these populations. And so Joe Boggs, your speaker next week, did a really great article on the cicadas. Um, so I would recommend that you click on that Beagle article to learn more. He also referenced cicada mania. So it's everything cicada. Um, it talks about the different species, the different broods, their distribution charts. And you can actually listen to their songs, which are deafening. Um, I, I joke with our master gardener volunteers and Ohio certified volunteer naturalists from our areas that we need to take a road trip just to experience the cicadas. The other website that I, I want to um, kind of leave you with as I'm winding down is the Cicada Safari. Um, and this is what's really important. They also have an app um, and what they're encouraging people to do is to report um, cicadas. And you take a photo of the insect, um, obviously it'll know your, your location, um, but they really want to get a handle on where this brood is emerging and where it's not. And so, you know, you may look at that map and say, gosh, we're kind of on the fringe or on the outside of that. We probably shouldn't have any, but I mean, you could. So, you know, moving, um, you know, soil, um, you know, materials that, that the insect is now, you know, part of that environment or that, that area. Um, so really take a look. If you're out and about and you see the cicadas, make the report to help them really get a handle on where this insect is and where it's not. And with that, I think um, we've got some time for some questions if people have those or maybe thoughts to share, um, you know, are they starting to see the, the cicada chimneys in their own landscapes? Hey, feel free to type your question in the chat or unmute yourself to ask Amy your question. We do have a comment in the chat that said, I experienced a 2016 broom driving to Pittsburgh while they were loud. Yeah, I was in Lake County. Um, it was early in my career. Uh, we were having a meeting and I mean, I just, I mean, it was wonderful to experience it and see it. Um, but after a while it was like, okay, I gotta get out of here. It just really uh, it hurt your ears. So uh, there's a question in the chat box. How far up a tree or plant will spotted lanternfly lay their eggs? What a great question. So they will take advantage of any um, ounce of that tree to lay eggs. And so unfortunately, um, we often in mature trees can't see to the very top. And so Although they're recommending that egg scraping um, and they can reduce populations, they're really not going to get them all. Uh, but the good thing is they lay them at all different levels. And so you'll be able to, if there is an infestation, see those even at eye level or below. 
Um, speaking of heights, it is very interesting that there is kind of a stage of in the adult um, stage of the insect where they're drawn to high things. And I didn't mention this in the presentation, um, but like utility poles or um, uh, cell phone towers, um, if you know the infestation is getting closer and population numbers are building, uh, there's folks that are actually just driving, looking at these um, tall structures and looking for adult activity. So at this point, I mean, we're too really early in the infestation to do that. Um, but as we progress, that might be something to, to look into. Do we want to read? Oh, let's see. Let me scroll up here a little bit. Hey, this has been very valuable information because we do have people on here from all across the state, not just Clermont County. So some of our participants are from the area where spotted lanternfly um, is being watched. So somebody said dodging them as you drive. Um, and do we want to reduce population? That is a great question, Deb. Uh, when it comes to the cicadas, um, I know sometimes people's first thought is when they see an insect is like to grab something, they want to manage it. But in this case, um, we really don't want to. I mean, they're not causing, um, you know, significant injury or damage to our plants. Um, it's um, an insect that has been around for a long time. And so you're exactly right. We really don't want to manage them because you're reducing the population. Um, and it's an, an insect that, um, you know, people want to have around. That's a good point. All right. And, oh, many cicada chimneys in yard in Kettering, the Dayton area. So, Joan, we may all want to come over and, and see that um, the emergence and the populations from your, your area. You could set up a lemonade stand and we could all come visit. Socially distanced, right, with our masks on, of course. <laughs> Do SLF have any natural predators? Uh, really good question. And so there are some birds uh, that will eat um, spotted lanternfly, um, specifically the adults. And in fact, um, gosh, there's an app for that. In Pennsylvania, they're encouraging citizen scientists to observe spotted lanternfly and take photos of birds that may be um, getting some of the adults. So that research is um, an observation um, work is fairly new, but I think we're gonna learn more from that. Um, there has been some work on some fungal pathogens um, and some native, and then of course they're looking at non-native um, predators as well. And so there's just a lot of research um, and knowledge being gained to hopefully better be able to manage this pest in the years to come. Uh, cleaning around my trees and flower beds, I am seeing the chimneys, didn't know what they were. Uh, this is in Morrow County. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, keep an eye on those um, and those would be great photos um, because what they're trying to do is determine the species within the brood um, and where they are. And so as you start to see the nymphs and finally adults, um, either get on that app um, or I think there are ways that you can report um, on the website as well. All right, any other questions? Well, I hope that um, I, you know, giving you a little bit of knowledge, um, you know, stay tuned. There are a lot of resources that are out there just to continue to grow that knowledge. Um, the other thing that I mentioned is, especially in the area of spotted lanternfly, you know, those maps that I showed you are dated. And so there could be a new infestation tomorrow that we learn about. So kind of stay up to date on what's happening. Um, currently, um, the quarantine in Ohio is being worked on. Uh, but there will be some quarantine information that's going to be distributed here pretty shortly. Um, they had a public comment period, but that's again in place to reduce the artificial movement uh, from Jefferson County out to other counties. And if you are from another county, uh, Amy has 
mentioned earlier to make sure you contact me, but you don't have to contact me in regards to spotting the spotted lanternfly. Please contact your local county extension office and they will be able to assist you on what needs to be done. Well, thanks for the invite, Gigi. I had a lot of fun. Thank you, Amy, for the information. It was very informative, getting lots of comments in the question in the chat box um, in regards to information that they had not heard before. So thank you much. I will stop the recording.